All good? So, uh, yep. Yeah, I mean, there's no really... Uh, okay, well, welcome to the... Uh, <laughs> the flight chap- to the lab. The, the epilogue <laughs> of uh, the epilogue. TCE. Um, at least uh, book one, chapter 37 or whatever this is. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll <laughs> so, see book two. Yeah, we'd have no clue. This is weird. Um, so we I started... Guess we should... Go ahead. Okay, I was going to say... Yeah, kind of reflecting back, the idea was create a place where we can start to engage in some really thorough discourse uh, that would probably be perceived as controversial in nature, but try to really get down and dig deep down into some certain topics. And it was always an experimental thing. Um, I think sure before you... we get into that, I kind of want to be a little more personal about it. Okay, so let's let's start there then. Um, I think that... So... I found behavior analysis as a behavior technician, and uh, actually, I always remember it. It's a June eighth, two thousand and nine, was my first work day ever. I was in training. I know that just simply because uh, I, it was like the, my freedom, my independence day from car sales, and it also happens to be the same day I met my wife. So I seem to that day sticks in my mind. But uh, you know, I was coming from this very intense like philosophical like logical analytic background to where everything to me had to fit within a very clean line and clarity of thought framework so which has a tendency to make someone argumentative even if they don't intend to be then on top of that i i had this idea of social relations and social dynamics from a poli sci perspective which uh at ohio state at least is uh what would, at the time would have been called a neoconservative or a, 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 a constructivist perspective that uh, produces people who see uh, rational actor models everywhere. And um, that's kind of how I looked at everything. Power dynamics in terms of money, in terms of people, in terms of control, and then pure logical positivism to the extreme, ration, rational detachment. That seems like a crazy thing to think someone in their mid twenties is like that, but I have a tendency to like I, 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 searching for truth is pretty important to me, and I, I, I had lost religion, so that was my new religion, and uh, I discovered the science, and uh, I, I hated it at first. I found it completely preposterous. I found the notion of uh, reinforcement and consequences and the way that it was structured counter to those narratives that I had been taught. Uh, what was logical. It violated some rules of logic to me in terms of linearity and clarity of deductive reasoning. And it forced me to dive very deep. And um, as I dive deeper and deeper and deeper, and as I made more friendships who mentored me through the process, and I found supervisors and I found practice, and I also saw the impact that it had on actual people, um, it started taking a shape in and of itself, or it started replacing my just... uh, my technical narrative of how relationships and thinking should be was something that actually had an underlining meta narrative of like a way to affect the world in a positive way and with a particular scientific background. Um, so that's how I found the science. That's why I fell in love with it. And that's kind of why I, I decided that's what I wanted to be because I still wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. So long story short, as the years passed or whatever, started graduate school and got the BCBA and got my first director job. And I met this guy in a, I'm a, I'm two days outside of my independence day. So I can talk about this. Um, after I'd worked about six, seven years in the field, I met a guy named Morton Hodlin. Um, and, uh, you know, he opened up my possibilities in a way where he freed me of kind of the, uh, how do I put this? Uh, conservative or like not conservative, but like fearful reactionary controls that come uh, with some of the regulatory and fee- touchy feely stuff that gets put in the field and really pushed me to just focus on the science, really understand human behavior and really seek that out. He's much more of a precision teaching guy and that's what he's built his school on. That's where his mindset is. But um, he really cheerled, cheerled me towards that, that direction. And, uh, He's a pretty free spirited guy, so he you know he creates his own everything, and he happened to run a conference and of his own, um, very small personal conference, and that's kind of where Ryan and I had an opportunity to meet each other. And uh, you know, you came with uh, Stu Law and uh, Mark Malady. Mm-hmm. 
And, uh, you know, I just, uh, up until then, I really hadn't met very many, uh, very many people who actually saw what we do the way that I see it. Most people see it through the autism centric lens, which is, again, this is not to criticize that. I think that's a very mm. laudable pursuit. And I think it's an important perspective. I'm just saying though, like loving the science for the science itself, um, and seeing it as an, as a, as a mean and an end, you know, and, uh, being able to have just like those dorm room type conversations in the middle of my office while shit's going down, having fun and just bullshitting and whatever really inspired me and whatever. And, and then, uh, you know, the year that the conference ended, we all shook hands, part of his friends. We really didn't talk very much. And then the next year the conference happens again, and then you come again. Uh, and we start talking and we're like, you know, we actually start talking about shared interests. And at that point you would just kind of launch the daily BA mm -hmm. and you were doing your thing and it, had, it was starting to get some traction, but it wasn't quite, it was still in its infancy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I still feel like it's that way sometimes <laughs> 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 to be completely honest. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah. wizard is uh never late, bro. He always <laughs> arrives exactly as he intended. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, and, you know, we were bullshitting and like that I discovered podcasting uh, and I'd always I'd been into like old school YouTube, not the way new school, YouTube, like the version of YouTube that was underground and like where it was mostly dominated by skeptics and philosophy people where they were like had these underground channels of like critical thinking and, and rationality rules type stuff. So it was it was it was a cool little community that wasn't as toxic as like, say, 4chan or Reddit. Mm -hmm. um, so we were like, you know having having the thought to do a podcast that kind of reflected that kind of culture where it was like th clear thinking critical thinking reason always first plus with a little bit of fun and like untethered uncensored speech uh i think was attractive and i you know i was looking for a creative outlet that was before i had started the doc program and stuff too so uh that's where we kind of got the idea to start this and I think uh, this has been, it's been what over, it's been two years now, right? Yeah. Right, Whoa. right around two years now. And that's two years later, we're sitting here and uh, it's been a crazy roller coaster ride. And I feel like we've done a lot. We've done a, we've done a lot and a little, both at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've, we've talked, we've talked to a lot of interesting people and we've talked to a lot of uninteresting people and we've done, uh, we, we're kind of sitting here and I think, uh, the, the thing where this has led us is to start really evaluating what do we want to do with this like clarity of purpose that the podcast has offered us. And I think that's mm -hmm. where we are right now. That's where I am at least mm -hmm. because uh, TC was an experiment. Like you started saying it was an experiment to see if behavior analysis was the type of place that was more for people like this kind of mindset where the science matters more than everything and um, applying it in a useful way is important and substantive, but not dominant. Um, and is it, it's an exercise in clarifying the human condition, because that's, that's my thing. And that's what I always cared about. And that's what I thought it was the answer to. And um, honestly, as we've seen the world uh, change so dramatically <laughs> with COVID, and as we've seen social and economic crisis hit, and as we've seen sociocultural shifts in dynamics and the emphasis and focus of our applied practice, journals, just general discourse, I'm not sure if what we do and the way that we do it makes a lot of sense in this form right now. Um, and I think that's what this episode is. I mean, that's what we're going to be doing here is just kind of providing a little bit of context and uh, setting the stage for what the future will hold. And uh, that's kind of where I am right now. I think this uh, uh, we're on a journey of discovery. I don't know. What about you? I just said most so, of it. So <clears throat> um, I've used this complete economic and social chaos of the last six months to really reevaluate things that I'm interested in, where I get my information, um, going in and out of like consuming too much or playing too many video games, like whatever, just like <laughs> just sliding into yeah. all of these like weird little rabbit holes or pitfalls. Um, and it's, it's led me to questioning, I guess where I want, what I know and what I want to influence me and like, how can I kind of 
redesign that a little bit. I love that. And, and so behavior analysis, like shared plenty of times on the podcast, found it 10 years ago, absolutely love it. The true like contextual ra uh, radical behavioral, like contextual worldview, like I love that. I will never leave that. I don't think ever. Um, it is fantastic. It's amazing. It affords all the opportunities to really look at the world through a, like a really good empirical lens. Um, part of it is realizing that uh, there's two things. You touched on the culture of having conversations and like are people really down to, to kind of let their personal opinions and different biases down or have them called out from both perspectives, either myself or Others call you know others calling us out or us calling them out, and that's that's been extremely hard to uh, evoke conversations in which that's okay. <laughs> and and uh, there's so there's a lot of podcast episodes here where we get into some interesting stuff, but we also don't get down to the the real level. I think that we need to, and that left us left us or I'll speak on my behalf. That leaves me um, just disappointed in the fact that we can't get there. And I don't blame the person in that case, but it's like, at what point do we keep trying if it's not necessarily working? Now, along the way, we found some amazing people that do want to go to that level. Um, an example is the final, I think the final podcast that we did with Jordan Blyle is, is like literally the perfect podcast episode. If I could recreate that every day, every week, uh, I would continue doing that. Um, but it's hard for us to get to that point with a lot of different people and different perspectives and different topics. Um, and to kind of couple that with where we've been in the last, I want to know, I don't know, since, I mean, we've always explored different areas, but especially the last few with uh, Ross Green, um, talking about some of the stuff with Michael Maloney, some of the stuff with Jordan Belial, uh, David, Cox, David Cox, right? Mm -hmm. Like those, those are also topics where we started talking about things that are not within behavior analysis that are purely uh, like models and frameworks and data about the world that I think are super fascinating. And so I almost want to spend far more time, and I have been kind of pivoting over to like consuming information that are outside of the field that are on topics that we're interested in, but um, I, like, like Jordan Belisle is talking about things, concepts in physics, and how do they apply to behavior analysis, right? And I just I don't think that that's interesting to a lot of people in the field. I think it should be very, uh, it should be the dominant conversation of like having conversations that are trying. I think to a lot of like it that. should actually be a part of behavior analysis, given where the climate is going and and the things yeah. that we can affect if we have a true radical behaviorist perspective. Yeah, like if we want to achieve like really saving the fucking world with behavior analysis we and need the things that, that stuff. people, yeah, like we have to start integrating and working with people. So I guess in a way it's like, it's hard to have the, I think TCE, I never, like we never stated goals and when it would be successful, but it's successful to the extent that the three of us now have a really damn good relationship. Um, the, the guests that we've talked to, we all have like now in our network, we know them better, we know when to call on them. <laughs> And there's even some of them that like want to get together and like really push some of the things that we've talked about. Like, I don't know what that is, but I'm hoping in the next year or so, like we can physically get some people together and be like, okay, these things that we've talked about, like how can we start applying them and like create some solutions for the world? And that is super interesting to me. And like, so it's been successful for TCE, but I've also realized like there's other things that I need to learn. Not, not just that I'm interested in what the other fields have to say about things that we talked about in behavior analysis and how they conceptualize it, but also things like uh, with David Co Cox's episode talking about coding, like I straight up need to learn Python. I need to spend hours next year per, per day, per week, um, learning how to understand that language and the possibilities of it. So in a way, the podcast has been successful, but it will be a barrier to spending the time on what we want to do next that is a result of this. And it doesn't mean that this isn't valuable and we can't turn it back on sometime, but it's like, hey, if it takes five hours a week, roughly, to, when we record, edit, and upload, and complete show notes, like we could spend that five hours doing something else. So, I don't know. Those are some words on it, I guess. It's it's been successful. Of course. I, well, I mean, I mean, it's been. How about this? I, I think successful is hyperbolic. I think it's been, it's been an unbelievable, unbelievably successful social networking and just 
relationship building opportunity. It's been eye opening. Business. It's been a business failure. Yeah, eye opening. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it's been. It's put what's, us in a con- it's put us in a conversation that I don't know that I never thought I'd be in, which is kind of like this like weird online loud BA community thing that uh, I, I just didn't see myself as being able to be considered a player in, even though I still don't think I'm a player in, but whatever. Yeah. Um, and it, but but as far as what it's really done is it's really helped mold what I believe in in a way that I can articulate it now. And I think I, what'll be interesting is. Uh, I mean, I haven't even asked you guys this, but I would love to, um, like, I think what folks will be seeing is hopefully seeing more elaborate uh, uh, projects or papers or things like coming next, right? Like the stuff that you two are talking about in your PhD programs, no pressure, but those dissertations sound fucking amazing, right? Wow. And I know you're still forming those, but like, I think that this was in a weird way. It's like led to some potential really cool things that could be like, like that is sciencing, right? This podcast has played a huge influence on the direction I wanted to go in research. Huge influence. These relationships, you guys. Yeah. So and maybe so, we should, maybe we should pivot and talk about that. Cause I think Danielle, you made, you know, when we talk on the phone, I mean, basically every day about fucking shit because it's like, I don't know, I'm going to do shit. I'm losing the world my mind. is shit. <laughs> and also like figuring out a dissertation, like people don't understand uh, like. Figuring out a dissertation, like you think, you think you know what you want to study <laughs> and then you just keep learning and you're like, oh my God, there's so many research questions and what do I want to do? And do I just want to like get a study done to be done or do I want to like make a difference? Do I want to <laughs> find something super impactful? Is it reasonable to find something super impactful? Oh, we have this three year deadline. Like, can I take longer yeah. to do this? Should I go ABD? Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, dude. And <laughs> my, my thesis was like a three month nightmare. Um, and I cannot imagine what y'all go through with. The well, and like level. I never did a thesis in my master's. So that was part of the, what I had to do in my doc program. And I did, I picked a really applied topic because the program, I'm not going to lie. They kind of like rush you through the thesis process. They're like, just get it done. Just get it done. Yeah. You don't, it's not mm-hmm. a big deal. Well, it, you know, it could have guided what I was doing in my dissertation, but you didn't have the time. They're trying to get you through your course sequence. You didn't have the time to come up with a topic. So I did an applied topic and it turned out really great. And it was really meaningful and it was socially valid and that's all fine. And then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll just continue with this into my dissertation. And then COVID hit and there's no grants and I can't go in the schools. And so I'm all right, well, how do I learn? Like, what am I going to get out of this program? And I was like, I really want to do something experimental or translational. I don't want to do the applied stuff anymore. And that was this podcast that made me start thinking that way. I don't, the applied stuff is important, but a lot of it is the same stuff. Um, Just like Jordan said on our last podcast, it's BST. It's you know, which reinforcement preference. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm over it. How do Function we train more people? How do we do telehealth? Okay, that's great. These are things that if we if we really understand our science, I don't think we need the research on anymore. If you understand these basic principles, you should understand how to develop this technology individualized to your caseload. And do we really need a, a whole journal talking about all of these things? I don't really think so. That's just my opinion. My mind could change. But like yeah. I wanted the experience to do something experimental, to get a better understanding of some of these basic principles, to know what it's like to run a lab. I've 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 taught myself a coding language very minimally, very basically, <laughs> designed a video game, trying to figure out how I can apply that to some things. Um, but like yeah, I just it's amazing the people <clears throat> we've met. It's amazing the directions we could go. I feel I, I do feel some sadness and regret over like how I feel I've been guided through this behavior analytic community to to not to still not be quite where I would like to be at the end of a doc program career wise and and radical behaviorist wise and that part makes me sad and somber. But at the same time, there's so many possibilities still. So I just have to, like you said, we need that time to work through those things and figure out that direction and how to make it feasible given the climate that we are in. Well, I want to measure stuff. I, I think that, <laughs> no, I, and I know that's a, that's a hypersimplification, but what I mean yeah. by that is, I mean, I, I, I appreciate a good philosophical conversation with the best of them. 
But in order to have an articulable philosophical conversation, one must be open to argument deconstruction and logical critique. Otherwise, you're just engaging in verbal masturbation. So, I mean, it, it, and what I'm seeing on the applied side of the field in particular is a lot of interjection, particularly in behavior analysis of practice and Java and uh, where it's the interjection of other theory and theory means philosophy in the social sciences, not mm -hmm. in the in the natural sciences. It means provable laws, typically, or at least almost provable laws within a particular statistical probability that is basically a hundred or mm -hmm. a one. Um, where in the social sciences, it means what we think this is based on what inferential data we can accomplish or whatever. And even in, even in that's that's even a higher bar than in a lot of instances. That's a huge distinction for listeners. <clears throat> if you look back and reflect on behavior analysis right now in the culture, we have a very strong divide starting. It's been there and growing of when do we lean to the inferential versus when do we lean to the actual hard mm -hmm. science? Yeah. And I, I don't see, I see us as a natural social science. I do not see us as a, as a barrier breaking advocacy network. Not to say that that's not a useful and that's not a necessary component of what people of high minded value and insight and education should bring to the table, but not as the primary end in and of itself. If you were to call yourself a scientist. Again, like it is all about goals, right? What's your goal as a person? Is your goal that? Amazing. God bless. Godspeed. And I, I root for you and vote for you every step of the way. My goal is I want is I want to empirically demonstrate things and I want to read about empirically demonstrable things. And I want to see how we are inching closer to identifying how things exist within a state of nature as it pertains to the human condition. And I feel like those two ideas are conflicting and there's not a lot of room for what I just said versus what is beginning to dominate within the applied space. Um, just to give some examples, uh, even if you read a conceptual piece, let's just say in JOB or let's just say in behavioral processing, let's just take some someone, for example, if people haven't read anything from uh, Tim Shahan, okay? And we talk about where he provides an entire cogent argument for the fact that reinforcement might not be real. And it's, a well, it's very, just a contract <laughs> very but it's a very va like he very validly ex demonstrates that it's possible that we've just interjected a, min a, the, a minute explanatory fiction in that particular moment in time of what a particular consequent does in terms of response strengthening uh and uh that is a very difficult paper to digest and understand without mm -hmm. getting super twisted over and um, you compare that argument with a couple of the other papers that I've read that come from that advocacy barrier breaking perspective. And I, I the one is about how does responding change as in what are the influencers of behavior? The other one is about how do we dictate or provide a moral or ethical framework for people's conduct? And I think that when we start getting into advocacy towards conduct versus exploratory empirical investigation of behavioral events we've overstepped and lost our way and i think for what i want to do on the podcast uh i want to do the the latter not the former and uh it's uh that that's not we're not in the place where that is should be happening and quite honestly i think that what we've all discovered too and what, what ryan kind of posed is that you know, part of our shtick too is actually being really well read on the things that we say. Mm -hmm. You know, I pride myself and I don't really typically say shit on the podcast if I am not like, if I haven't read it pretty thoroughly. <laughs> yeah. I may use the word fuck excessively and use a bunch of a uh, variety of profane ways and hyperbolic <laughs> statements and engage in boisterous behavior, but uh, it's, it's pretty backed. Um, and on the experimental end of things, I'm starting to learn that, uh, all applied, all the applied literature that I've read really provides a superficial understanding of it. And I, I find that it's obsessed with triviality in a way that uh, initially made me sad because I thought I wasted 10 years of my life. But then, on the other hand, made me super excited because rather than thinking that I had it all figured out, I, I get to start over again and begin a whole new learning journey. And the people that we've interviewed, especially the last few episodes, have, have given me that hope of like, look at the cool places we can go. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm sure we're missing 
are, are some amazing people that are out mm, there. So yeah. if at any point people listen to this podcast episode or any of them and they reach out and they want to talk, like I'm glad I, I to chat with people and, and see what they're doing and understand 100%. what's going on. I, I don't know what's going to form of this, but um, at this moment in time, like I really want to get together like 30 to 50 people some that have been interviewed on this podcast, others that I know, and bring everyone together for a giant mastermind week of like, what is being built? Who knows what? Like, what can we do next? And so- Where can we converge? Whenever the fuck that can happen and the logistics of that, I don't know. Like, that's that's one thing that I have uh, need to make happen. So like, there's still stuff that's gonna be going on behind the scenes. Um, I wanted to bring back slightly that like, uh, joking about not being happy with the Daily BA stuff, but also, I didn't get to finish part of this was uh, I was talking with Nick Green. He's done a, he's got his own podcast and a number of other ones out there. Uh, he's a behavior analyst, interested in sports, health, fitness, health, fitness, I would say um, is his area. And if you check out his Instagram um, and things that he posts, he's trying to translate like behavioral data, behavioral uh I would say principles, facts, and trying to say like, here's how it applies to your health and fitness. And one giant thing that I've assumed on, and I'm curious if you think the, what you all think about this, but that I've assumed on <laughs> foolishly <laughs> on uploading the daily BA is that if I have a couple key things on there and like, hey, remember we're behavior analysts, like this should, this should always be measured. This should always be like evaluated. Like there's things like that that were assumptions for viewers. And, and that's just fucking stupid when you're putting out public facing content. Like what I need to do, I think is if there's a video that's uploaded that it needs to show what our field's about. It's like, I need to show the data. I need to show the process, if that makes more sense. And and those are the things that I've been lacking. And so I, I almost want to, uh, when I don't know when we were talking about this. I don't think it was on air, Dimitri, but I was just like, I'm unhappy with <clears throat> certain content. And you're like, is it something in fact of like, you know, you're superseding where you were before or something like that. Um, like you're, 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 it's growing to the next phase. And I was like, I think I, do you remember that? Remember saying yeah, that? Yeah, man, I think that it's evolution. Like, here's the thing, like, again, like well, two years point, doesn't. Th- what I was what? gonna say, oh, just to close, I thought, what I was gonna say is all of these have been really good reflection points for me of like, I should probably have something built into my daily BA episodes that if I upload something that there should be some quick, even if it's 15 seconds to a minute of like, here's how I know that. Mm -hmm. And like, here's the fucking data, right? And I'm gonna show you exactly. And that was things where, uh, what I see Nick Green posting on social media right now is not the hottest thing on social media, but it is one of the like tightest things that I see on there because he's saying, like he's not posting hypothetical data. He's not making a meme. He's like, here's my fucking client outcomes that I performed with behavior analysis and here, um, is how I know that that actually worked. And so like, I need to start embedding those sort of things in the things that I'm doing. Um, and, and that's where I kind of want to really challenge myself. Can I do that? Cool things are coming. Yeah. Yeah. I I love that. I mean, I I think that it's just, but I mean, that's part of it though, is you got to be where you were to get to where you're going and to get to where you are. And like in hindsight now, it's like, that was lazy shit. I need to step it up. (laughs) Like, and I need to include some parts that that are important that to be embedded there. Like I think you're being hard on yourself, but it was maybe. meaningful to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, or yeah. has been and is. And so like, if I like, I've got, I've got a couple of visions. I hope that they, they, they work out. Like I can see the videos. <clears throat> I've been thinking about them for weeks and how I want to do this kind of putting all the pieces together that I've learned. Um, I think there was one assumption in your content that you made just inherently, which was that there was an already from the audience you were targeting, which was behavior analysts Mm -hmm. or aspiring behavior analysts was an all the the assumption was that they, they had already contacted that data and had that general understanding of metrics coming into it, the ability to do that. And and I think that this is where, this is the last time we're going to record probably for a very long time. Uh, just because I have to disappear. I don't know about Danielle, but I'm going to disappear into a deep dark hole and start reading and writing pretty hard. So, um, but I mean, like we, our field is astoundingly arrogant as far as the applied side and bafflingly wrong about a lot of shit in terms of what the facts are and the data that support them and, and like, support the way that we say things. 
and and when I say this, I also put it on that exact content that I was putting out. Like we're not we're not <clears throat> expecting, especially creators online, to demonstrate the and like live out actual behavior analysis, which is showing the data and showing 100%. like how they know their shit. And that's the part um, that I want to. I'll probably need a couple months to kind of figure out how to transition into. But like, that's where I'm gonna start throwing my time. Like how yeah. in 2021, can I start creating uploads or whatever I put my hand on, like, like it, it has, it, and it's a behavior analysis embedded. And that's what I need to focus on. Um, I see that's where, that's where like for me at least, and cause Danielle, what, what I was hoping you were gonna talk about Danielle is how like you made that you're like, everything is choices really when it boils it down is. to it. It is, know? yeah. Everything and is choices, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna think of ways of around how to merge the many models of choices because you have the matching law, you have social discounting, you have, you know, all these different ways for us to look at choices and why we make the choices. But we've never really looked at like a comprehensive, like they they only account for so much. How come we haven't looked at how they integrate together? <clears throat> and like literally everything you do is a choice, everything can choose to do nothing and you can choose to do something and in those somethings you have infinite amounts of choices some more probable and some less probable you know like yeah just, relative to particular contextual variables and environmental influences uh you know learning history also whatever, standing yeah. in relation to your learning history like it's like so i'm it's not like gonna this. stand here and take all my clothes off on this podcast but that is a very low probability thing that i could choose to do <laughs> like you know what i mean and it's just crazy to think about those and and how how do we I don't know how do we conceptualize that and why are we is, not is, harnessing is, that? But is I mean Danielle, that, that goes is Danielle to considering an OnlyFans is the next step. So what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on right now? But I mean that that also speaks to like when we we, we talked with Jordan a little bit about this and that like this what this awakening at least for me it's been a total eye opening experience is that like the three term contingency was or the four term contingency, whatever fifth term, even an interbehavioral model. If you add a little bit of fear of field theory with Cantor, it's still yeah. such an oversimplification of human existence that, uh, you know, beyond the principle of selection by consequences, it's a construct in a way that is limiting. Yeah. And it limits the conversation too. And, uh, this is going to sound shitty, but I'm going to say it because again, this is the last episode and I can, and I'm, it's kind of why I want to take a break and pause and go get good myself because it's a criticism I have of myself up until now um, is that it, it provides a lot of people with unsophisticated perspectives to claim to be experts. And uh, it's not <clears throat> it's not good enough. It's not it's not not right. Not not quite. It's de it's just plain not right. It's very scary for a field and practice yeah. at that point when that starts to dominate, too. And exactly. so it's. uh I watch a lot of social media content and uh, even things that are happening now in our publication, our journalists, which is like complete fear of where things are going to go um, because it is, it is, what was it? Uh, Skinner had the flight from the laboratory um, or no, the, what was it? Farewell, my lovely saying bye-bye bye to the cumulative recorder and bye-bye to rate of response. And why are we doing this? You see the folks at squab that we've talked about <laughs> or, um, the folks at ABI that are in the corner of the room talking to 15 people about how messed up things are and this is the science that they're really into and, and talking about some crazy application they're working on. And I think all those folks were calling the shots and saying like, hey, we're our field's sliding into uh, something that's not natural science anymore. Um, and so, yeah, I wanna, I wanna keep paying attention, but I don't, I don't like a lot of the flavors because it's lacking that behavioral explanation. And, and I think and there's, I think, I mean, I mean, you could look at it as the whole field is sliding into that, or you could look at it as this field is branching off into two different directions. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, like what, what, what's going on uh, is there's like, uh, this is a better way to frame it. There's description, prediction, control. Like our field is almost going purely into description uh, valuing description over any mm -hmm. prediction or control or influence whatsoever and those descriptions <clears throat> are on super shaky foundations logically data wise like it's, it's extremely scary yeah so philosophically um and that that doesn't mean that there's not some exceptions out there doing some pretty damn exciting work so i'm gonna keep keep reading what comes public what's getting out there we're gonna keep sharing keep feeding me stuff i hope you know like, that you all are sending me um 
but it's it's like there's such an appetite whetted for other things out there and then figuring out what to do and what to make next so dude um, jack marr verbal behavior or mathematics is verbal behavior rocked my brain yeah you like, know and this is this shout is out dr garcia this is something we've talked about we still haven't committed to per se but like I think for anyone that's like, yo, this podcast has been extremely useful for me as a practitioner. I relate to a lot of things that you're saying, because I know there's a lot of you out there that mm-hmm. that this uh, functions in that sort of way for. Um, we, we've we talked about, like, is there a way that you could create some sort of course content or some sort of in-person experience? Like, is there a way that we could bring, you know, more value to people in a different way that's not a podcast? So if you have ideas yeah. or requests for that, like if there was a TCE's, uh, you know, approach to um, understanding consuming research, like if there was, uh, you know, a mentorship guidance sort of model, like those are things that we're, we've actually considered and I think would be useful for the community. Mm-hmm. Um, now is not the time because everyone's, you all are busy as shit with your, <laughs> with your PhDs and stuff. But like, I don't know. There's going to be something next after TCU that's like helping people in the community that have found yeah. uh, this place is a home. And I don't know what that is. And I'm open to ideas. We're just not committed yet because we're trying to figure it out the next however long. TCE is book one, dude. This is a, yeah. a minimally a trilogy, you know. And I think, a, <laughs> you know, we just haven't, you know, the, the big bad hasn't even been revealed yet. The, the Well, maybe it has in the, as a specter in the background. <laughs> but I mean, like, earnestly, like, my goal is to continue to dive deep into the experimental literature, figure out, I, I mean, discounting is my new obsession just because it kind of kind of got presented to me. And as I dig into it, it's weird how life comes full circle. Cause again, like poli sci, dude, I, I, you know, poly, I say it's political science that I've majored in, but actually it was international studies with an emphasis in international relations and diplomacy, specifically international relation, international relation games. So like, you know, state actor models and game theory was my bachelor, my second bachelor's degree. So like you pair that with, uh, I love that shit. <laughs> like I love that shit. Then evaluating power dynamics, decision making, choice making, outcomes, variations of prisoners' dilemmas, stag hunts. What other type of construction of models you can put down? Blended models, like that shit that I I loved. And then, you know, behavior analysis. Or when in my the initial stages are like all well, those assume agency and agency isn't real and blah 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 and then it, it, it kind of like shifted into a different adoption from a religious perspective that now is wrong ideological position and uh, seeing now how all the most sophisticated thinkers that started out as behaviorists have actually are now doing that kind of work because they do it in a quanta- quantitative way looking at how it fits in mathematical models to measure those types of choices and actually represent them, you know, predictively at mm-hmm. like Skinner did with rate of response as in like changes in behavior relative to consequences. That was what was special about it. What's special about it is that he could predict the changes. Okay. That, that was going to go up. And then what Ogden Lindsley refined it with acceleration chart, adding the notion of a log to, even though he never necessarily empirically validated it, it fits mm-hmm. within that shift. But then when you get even more sophisticated statistics that come into play and you can see the hyperbolic changes in various types of social discounting or any type of discounting whatsoever. And the, as the models get better and better, you know, we have a lot more ways to look at the way behavior is. And then with the advent of social media and the reality of behavior science manipulating the universe to the point where we're seeing the potential collapse of democracy. Um, we need to awaken ourselves to the fact that maybe rather than just being disability advocates, not, again, not that that's not an important thing. That's a very important thing. That's a very critical, important thing of people who need need somebody and they need them for real. Mm-hmm. But if they're going to if you're going to call yourself a particular kind of scientist to to concern yourself with the ways to effectively quantify those things in an open source fashion that fights against all these various closed door patents that exist and closed door algorithms and machine learning and AIs that are literally destroying the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's not paranoia. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my headspace and where I think we should be going and what matters. And that's what I think we should be measuring. And that's what I think we should be talking about. And, uh, and an applied side of the field should be focused on interrupting and disrupting that machination. Um, rather than some of these theoretical and conceptual shifts that I'm seeing that uh, don't quite add up and or have places in other houses. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. it's just, 
it's just is what it is. And um, but as far as like what book two is going to look like, we're going to educate ourselves. We're going to actually do some research and we're going to actually have some quantitative numbers and figures and be much more articulable in terms of model creation and that kind of thing before, you know, whatever version 2.0 of TCE will look like, because there will be a 2.0 just because I think that when it boils down to it, I suffer from pressured speech in a way where eventually I'll hit a bottleneck and I'll just call Ryan and say, get the fuck on the mic. We got to talk. <laughs> um, and Danielle, the same thing. But um, also because uh, we need um, we need actual sophisticated people in the field to open their mouths. I think the biggest disappointment that you kind of hedged on and touched on, Ryan, has been um, we've had to meet an opportunity to meet some great people. And we've had two or three or four or five or six or seven or ten people really do drop their guard and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But some of the most revered, greatest, you know, great best and baddest people in the field who get a lot of love and a lot of admiration um, for fear of whatever social censure might occur for just simply speaking outwardly and openly about what they see and what they understand to be the directions of the field. They can't <clears> and that. also them, they can't even speak, uh, speak factually without factually that fear correct. now. That, that's the other thing. Um, so, and that's happening not just on the podcast, it's happening on Daily B episodes, it's happening on the filming that we're doing for the On Location series that we're working on. Like it is, it is unbelievably permeated and everybody's scared it's not just in behavior analysis it is in behavior analysis though the online culture has set us up to not be able to say things in and you can't really take a stance one way or the other without getting you can't you can't take a factual stance like Mm -hmm. without uh, like uh, that that fear is there to take you can take it and i hope in the long run it'll 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 be what's dominating again at some point but I don't even think um, it's a stance. I think it's just articulating what the data says and not applying mm-hmm. interpretation to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody wants to see data and necessarily interpret it through whatever their lens is. And, you know, one of the, my favorite things that I've been corrected enough now on as I've been going back and forth with some of my mentors <coughs> it, from uh, some of the decision making, choice making and discounting lit is that, like, they explicitly state this is just measuring an effect. Mm-hmm. Any, any, there is no statement of interpretation or explanation that one can apply other than measuring what is occurring relative to this thing. It's a phenomenon. That's been, so, like, any inference in terms of uh, narrative is mm-hmm. not one that they they can even begin to express empirically in any fashion whatsoever. And it means nothing as far as that stuff goes. It's just more like this is what the measure is. Uh, and I think that. I think we would do a lot better to go back to that mind frame where we're just looking at what the measures are without necessarily looking to apply our own meta narratives to the situations. I like Again, that. that's not the discount meta narratives. I think they're important in terms of meaning making and sense making, but I don't think that they, uh, I also think that they have a tendency to color the quality of discourse. And when it boils down to it, if we perpetuate a culture of homogenous thinking, that squelches heterodox thoughts and opinion um, and doesn't permit for reasonable ranged contrast of points of view, then we create the conditions of our own destruction because then variability by definition is how growth occurs. And if you Mm -hmm. limit variability, stagnation is what you results and stagnation is the inevitable decline. That's, that's when the universe will cease to exist is when it stagnates because it will no longer be expanding. And that's, that's literally called cold death. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolute zero. So just some food for thought. <laughs> I don't want to say marvelous to that because that's a little <laughs> sad. <laughs> Super <laughs> depressing? <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. But, you know, it's a nice ending yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Um, I mean, when we finish book two of data and reflection and sciencing in different ways i guess we'll uh we'll be back maybe but uh oh we'll be back so keep, don't you worry keep about the, that i got i got some paradoxes i'm ready to explore i got some games already we're gonna in my find head some that are playing. answers yeah i got some ai stuff that i would love to talk about i think there's some such amazing opportunity for a behavior analytic perspective like a radical behavior analytic perspective that can start actually looking at some of these paradoxes that have permeated computer science and decision-making theorists um, that don't have what we have, which is radical behavioral and functional contextualist perspectives Mm -hmm. that can actually empirically validate ideas and beliefs 
and I'll give everyone an example from our uh, podcast with Jordan. You know, he it's so fascinating how he framed relational, how he used relational frame theory to uh, quantify ideas and polar polarized forces in terms of verbal behavior. That's not the way it's articulated in most social sciences. They the, the best tool that I've found in measuring belief is either Big Five, either some interesting interesting uh, political placement tests that exist on grids, or there's another one called Belief in a Just World Assessment that kind of gives a number to how just a person thinks the world is relative to their particular ideological position. They're psychometric and they're validated, but uh, they don't really, they're fixed. They don't permit for that, that float of back and forth, that social mediated component that we understand as essential to engage in verbal behavior and also to engage in communitarian acts. Um, so if you were to replace those tools and, and bring in a relational frame perspective paired with a verbal behavior explanatory framework and then run the same types of assessments and then provide those types of statistical outputs, then what have you done? You've clarified and cleaned up social science in a way where you've brought in behaviorism in order to do that. So you've put it on better solid empirical uh, footing and you get to use our science in a way that actually produces scalable results rather than discrete individual units of responding. Um, and that's just an example of where I think the options and possibilities are, because I'm going to go back to Jack Moore. Mathematics is verbal behavior. Um, it's the potential is there and, uh, we need to start thinking about scale. And this actually is the beautiful, I think this is a beautiful wrap up because this brings us full circle to the beginning. When we first started the podcast, our question was, how the fuck do we scale this goddamn thing, man? How do we, <laughs> it's, you know, because the first episode was, do we deserve to be in autism? You know, and the question, the, the, the answer was, you know, we, we don't, or do we deserve to get out of autism? And the answer yeah. was, we don't even deserve to be in autism to begin with. Um, and uh, that is because that it's, it's, we've, our ideological position and our model and our framework has locked us in a particular box and it's become stale, it's become stagnant, it's not perpetuating, it's shifting people into more of, a, uh, of, of this advocacy perspective. And uh, now it seems that with there, I see a light, I see a window that mm -hmm. I think we should crack open and see what, what, has to, what, what can of worms we can open up and see. And that will probably be book two. Book two will be, you know, showing people that where else we can go with this stuff if we're willing to acquire the skills necessary to do that. And that's the other thing is that, you know, intellectual humility is um, not necessarily a thing that we've publicly demonstrated on the podcast, but it's a thing that we demonstrate reflectively in this behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely what we do uh, because if you don't have it right, you, you deserve whatever criticism you get. And getting it right matters, at least to the best of your ability, right? Um, and, uh, we need that. We need those skills. We need statistics. We need model thinking. And um, we need alternative routes to exercise what we do so we can actually contribute positively to the world. So, um, yeah, thank you. And I, and I just want to say personally, you know, Ryan, uh, obviously, our French, this is, this is, you know, you're still my point of view. We're, oh, yeah. I'm yeah, probably going to still call you every single day. But I mean, like, so, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't want people to, yeah, I don't want people There's to think that this is like where we end. Oh, but like no. I, I literally talk to Danielle almost Are every day. Are you breaking up with me, Dimitri? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, it's not Is this you. Because it's me. Your newfound bromance with <laughs> Jordan. You know, I just replaced you with Jordan Belial. But, uh, Dude, but I, I mean, I, like I, really, I think. I, go ahead. Say, I, I really want to get. Uh, uh, I'm hoping we can continue some sort of uh, weekly chat with some of even of the people we've had on here. Like I think we need to figure out. I still think uh, when, we have the opportunity the to build a community around the things that we're learning, right? Yeah, like, yeah. We'll, we'll I think it's about values, though. Yeah, yeah, we'll flush that out. But I yeah, think we'll the out. biggest thing is that now that we've... I, I feel like I'm more in touch with my values now. And I don't think I was there before. Before, we were trying to figure out really what we believe. Like, we knew it was behavior stuff, but we didn't really know, like, why. And we didn't really know, like, how. We didn't really understand, like, what our red lines are. And, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about COVID and some of the experiences that we've had on the podcast, it's been able to, for me to establish what my fucking boundaries are too. And like, that's mm -hmm. been personally liberating. Actually, it took some turmoil and some, some, you know, inner shit stirring, but, uh, you know, to get here on the other side, like 
I, I, I feel like I know what I want. I feel like I know what I believe. And that's that. And I don't think we're in a position or a place in the field right now where <clears throat> most people are interested in hearing that, at least in the, in the audience's perspective. And if, for those of you that do feel that way, please know we're going to leave all of our social channels up. Yep. And I mean, they, they all come to our phones. So it's not yep. like we don't see everything. Um, Emails, you know, anything. Email too. So if we if, if something's interesting enough and worthy enough, you know, again, this is we're not pulling the plug on everything. We're just not going to be scheduling things on a regular basis. And uh, maybe we'll do something interesting here. There are special edition six months or something like that. But realistically speaking, TCE is a general experiment. I think it's time to start exploring what the next phase is. And uh, that's where we are. Marvelous. Marvelous. 